Okay, so this is Full Salvation Part 2. I was having trouble splitting the audio because there was some singing halfway through the audio message on the uh, original version of Full Salvation. So by now you would have seen Full Salvation Part 1 and this is Full Salvation Part 2 which picks up the audio of Frank Hunting after the singing had finished which I didn't want to violate copyright. So there you go, this will be the, the intro to Part 2. Thanks for watching. Now, whilst I know from personal experience that men and women are healed by God as they believe and as they go to him in the way that the New Testament says they ought, that wonderful things happen that are nothing less than miracles. Yet I'm sure that those who would have thought from the title that I've given to this address uh, they would have been making assumptions that wouldn't be true of me because there are good people who think and I'll tell you why I would not you know why I'm not doing that who believe that in the cross of Jesus uh, you and I have the right to claim healing physical healing that is uh, just the same as we can claim salvation. And just as you claim salvation through the cross and you know that Jesus died for you, that God raised him from the dead, and uh, because of that when you go to him for the pardon of your sins and the salvation of your souls, then you have salvation. Now they say that in the same way you can go to the cross, you can go to Jesus, and claim, it's your right to claim, that healing is there in the cross. Now at first sight that to some of you might seem to be a very attractive teaching. It can and does have disastrous results. I've known from personal experience where folk who have been desperately sick folk with cancer, terminal or advanced heart disease terminal too and these good folk, well-meaning have gone to these folk and have told them that in the cross of the Saviour there is healing and when that healing hasn't taken place that they could claim it just as they claim salvation and God would heal them, there'd be no doubt about it when that healing hasn't taken place the shattering that has come to that desperately sick person has been terrible now having said that I want again to affirm and I really do know and believe that God does heal oh yes he heals and I would say that if I had any mild complaints with say a church like our own that we've left out of our ministry to people effective praying for folk who are desperately ill we've not done very much thinking about it we've not really sorted it all out we're all mixed and muddled and when we get presented with some person somebody who's desperate need there's a little group of people who do pray in faith. Well, we're all over the place. We're running around. We don't know really where we stand. And we, we've never sorted this one out. With God, and with the New Testament, and with ourselves. And that would be one of the complaints that I would have with a church like our own. We don't do enough of it. Or we're frightened of it, or we push it away, or we got all sorts of mixed up ideas but I'm not really wanting to talk about that excepting that those passing by seeing that title would have assumed some of them any rate that I was going to talk to you tonight about healing and that's not what I'm on about at all I'm, I'm really on what the New Testament would I think it doesn't use the word because for it in the New Testament salvation is full it's we who have sort of whittled it away. It's we who have made it something less 
than what the New Testament talks about. So I want to try to bring to you, if I may, some of the grand and great things that are in the New Testament about this word salvation. Now the very first thing that you've got to get hold of is that salvation is of God. It's a thought of God. Now there's nothing that you or I or anybody else can do about what God has done. God has done it. The whole human race can be saved. He has done that. And uh, we can't alter it. We can't change it. And that ought to be good news to Christians. Really very, very good news. It ought to be good news from this point of view because some of us at different times in our Christian living we don't really do very well. We're not sort of exhibit A. You, you wouldn't be putting us up uh, for everybody to have a look at and say, now, that's what it is to be a Christian. Uh, we're not performing too good. And sometimes when you talk to people, Christians like that, you get the idea that they seem to think that when they're going good or when they're performing well as a Christian, then they're right, they're, they're, they're saved. But if they get out of line some way, then they're not saved. Well, God doesn't love them anymore. Or well, he's forgetting them or he's abandoning them. Now, that isn't true. Well, God doesn't like you and I or anybody else who, who, who is one of his children or those who aren't Christians, he, he doesn't like the kind of performance we put in sometimes. But if you've received Jesus, then you are saved. Now you might at this moment be doing very well as a Christian, but you're still saved. You may even be another disgrace to the Christian faith. You may be one whom you know others can look at you and say, oh, him a Christian. Well, if he's a Christian, I don't want to be him. Well, the grace and the salvation of God is so marvellous, and this is quite beyond me, that you're still saved by him. You see, salvation is, is with God. It's something he has done. And you don't alter it, you don't change it, you don't modify it, you don't do anything about it. You either accept it or you don't. You receive it or you don't. Now, we can, of course, limit, and this is what most of us are doing in one way or another. We can, of course, limit our experience of God's salvation. Now, I'd like to add a little bit to that word salvation, if I may now, at this time. Now, I don't know in the adding whether I'm helping or, or hindering you. But that word salvation can be a word that we uh, limit very much. We don't really pour into it the content that it has in the, in the New Testament. If you were to think of being a whole person, you'd have the idea. Nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing wrong. A complete person. A person who is emotionally mature and developed really adult, really Christian, emotionally. A man or a woman whose thinking has really been changed by Christ and who has the mind of Christ, a whole person. A person whose will is so acting that it always comes down on the side of what God wants and obeys him. A whole person, a complete person, a total person. That's the idea that's in this word salvation. Well, we can limit that, our experience of God's salvation, and that's one of the things that so many of us as Christians are doing. Some limit the salvation of God, of course, altogether. You saw Philip Adams this afternoon on TV. Well, he limited in total. Total. <laughs> Don't have a bar of it. 
Now, the great majority of men and women do just that. Now, some limit their experience salvation to the merest beginnings of God's salvation. They receive Christ and that's it. They don't ever seem to go on. And that's sheer tragedy. Well, that is tragedy. When you think of all the fullness there is in salvation. Others, of course, limit their salvation by, and these are Christians, they live in the memory of some wonderful thing that God did for them but it was 15 years ago. And they had this tremendous experience 15 years ago. And ever since, they've been trying to relive that marvellous experience they had. And they're way back there, 15 years back. Now they limit their experience of salvation to that. Robert Schuller on TV this morning early interviewed Pat Boone and he said to him now tell us what, what has Jesus been doing for you during the week he put his finger right on it didn't he you and I ought to be able to say what he's done for us this day and it ought to be good it ought to be exciting it ought to be worthwhile you, we don't want to limit our experience to something that's in the past others of course are opening more and more of their lives to this marvellous and wonderful salvation of Jesus. And they're, they're sort of just opening up all the time to what he is and what he can be and what he can do. I've got a quaint expression to, at this point now. But I, I'm, I'm trying to say it so that it will be real to you. Salvation is all here. It's all here, now. It's not something that you've got to wait for, nor is it something that you've got to wait until you die to get. It may be a funny way of putting it, you know, to say that salvation is all here. That might be very funny. And what I'm saying is that there's nothing lacking in the salvation, the wholeness, the fullness, the completeness that God is offering to you and I now. Oh, you and I may and do hinder. And, you know, we, we get incredibly lazy as Christians and we won't grow and we don't grow or we get off on wrong tracks. The salvation of Jesus is so vast so unfathomable that you can never come to the end of it. For years now, about 15 years after I woke up to this, I thought, oh, it can't go on any longer. You, you'd come to a dead stop sooner or later. Every year of my life has been better than the last one. Every year has got better and better. None, that's, that's got nothing to do with me. All of, you know, I learned a few secrets, that's all that really is saying, where you just learn to more and more open yourself to God. And of course, as you're doing more and more of this, things are just getting better and better. More and more of his salvation coming to you. You're receiving it all the time. It's wonderful. You never come to the end of it. You won't come to the end of it even in eternity. Now that's tremendous. It's really breathtaking, that tremendous thought. And yet we often live as though we can exhaust or have come to the end of God's salvation for us. We live as if, you know, we've got it all. We've stopped. When I was a young Christian, I'll give you a little bit of biography now, autobiography. When I was a young Christian, sal salvation for me meant nothing more than being saved when you stood before the judgment seat of God. Now that was the only concept that I had about salvation. 
I knew that I'd have to stand before God. I knew I'd have to give an account to him. And because I'd received Jesus, I would be pardoned. I had that and no more. Now, of course, that's out of favour today. And there are plenty of people around and about who would rubbish that. And they would point out all sorts of things about it that's limited. And they'd have a grand old time going to work on it. But as far as I'm concerned, and I'm quite sure that the New Testament is right here, spot on, that still is the most important thing for any single one of us. Nothing more important than that in our salvation that when we stand before the judgment bar of God, we will have the pardon of Jesus. Now I'm telling you that if eternity is at stake, and it is in this matter, then that is the most important thing there is for every single human being living. But there's a lot more to salvation than that. An incredible lot more. I began after that, some years after it, to learn another marvellous truth about salvation. I began to learn that salvation is for the here and now. Now, for, for me at that time, that was quite new. Quite new. It was a, an addition to what I already knew. So I began to allow God to work this out in my life. And the very first thing where I could say that here in this life that Jesus was saving me was in the area of impure thinking. That was the first place where he began here and now to save in the area of impure thinking. Well, you know, I began to see and learn other things. I began to learn that through what was then called a full surrender, you sort of got lifted to a higher plane of living. I heard that you could be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And life could be changed, your life. And that... that that was a bit of a danger for me. I am, and those of you who might have very much to do with me, will always pick up that I'm, I'm very sensitive to people who get talking about their experience, their spiritual experience. I've met so many people who strut and I found once or twice when God had done some really wonderful things for me that I too wanted to strut, be a spiritual snob. And I know of nothing worse than that for you, a spiritual snob. Of all the most despicable, despisable creatures on the face of this earth, a spiritual snob is about the worst. Oh, and, and, and if God's done marvellous things in your life and for you, you must guard against that one. The old devil will see to it that you do a strut if he can. Well, other things were to come. God had to show me a, a tremendous truth. And I hope he'll show you this one too. It's found in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. I don't care much which um, uh, translation you look it up in. Would you like to have a look at it? If God shows it to you, this one, it, it doesn't have a bad effect on you. It doesn't make you sort of depreciate yourself. It doesn't do that. And yet it's a, about the boldest statement of your own blackness that you could find anywhere, any place. And what it does is it just 
really gives you an insight into yourself. And because you're getting it through the Holy Spirit, it doesn't disturb you, it just keeps you there seeing what you are. But within you there dwells no good thing. And you know that to be true. Now that doesn't fill you with dismay. It just shows you constantly and continually how much you need every breath you take the grace of God. And if you're anything at all, you're only that by the grace of God, nothing other. Well, there are other things that I needed to be saved from. I needed to be saved from being critical and judgmental. Oh, that's a... <laughs> Some of us need a lot of the grace of God to go to work on us there, don't we? We do want to be critical and we do think we've got a right to be judgmental and we do think we've got a right to blame. Oh boy, oh boy, who gave you or me or anybody else the right to walk around on the face of this earth looking for someone to blame? We're always doing it. Let something go wrong. I could throw a brick through the television sometimes when some of these very smart, what do they call them, journalists, I think they call them, the fellows that poke the, the microphone under the nose of somebody they're interviewing and ask those stupid questions. But about the intelligence of a seven-year-old kid. One of the first things they come up with, who do you blame? Well, that's one of the things that a Christian has to get out of his system, isn't it? And we have to be saved from always looking for someone or something in someone to blame. The salvation of God has something to do with that. And the salvation of God has something to do with something that's lacking in most of us. It was lacking in me. And I need it desperately. To love. To just love. Oh, it's easy for me to love some people. No bother at all. And it's not so easy about other people. And I am to love everybody. I was one who had all sorts of attitudes. <laughs> Seemed to be a part of my nature. Oh, don't we excuse a lot of things by saying it's my nature. Well, that's what we need to be saved from. That old, crimped up, crabbed up nature. It's all wrong, going in the wrong direction. Nothing like the Lord Jesus. That's what salvation is all about. Full salvation. And the marvellous thing is, you know, God's not a bit concerned about the poor old crabbed, crimped, twisted person you may happen to be. You're not the, he's not in the least bit put on the stretch if you've been Adelaide's worst sinner. That doesn't upset him, that doesn't startle him, that doesn't take him by surprise. Not a bit of it. God can change any man. The salvation of Jesus is so full, it's so wonderful. It can meet anything and everything in any person if we'll only let him. Where do you start? Well, you start with the new birth. That's the start always. How do you keep it going? Well, the best advice I could possibly give to any, anybody who's just become a Christian or those of you who've been Christians for 50 years, concentrate on Jesus. Concentrate on Him. In the days when I was back in Ballarat again and again, I would tell people, don't you dare look at people. Get your eyes on anybody and you're a goner. 
You concentrate on him. That's the second thing to do. Fix your eyes on him and don't take them off. And make your number one priority, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And base your life on that and live it out. And you watch God do wonderful things in your life. You know what it says, or oh, of course you don't. People are always quoting texts to me as though I know all the Bible. Every, you know, what um, Hezekiah 6.1 is. I haven't got a clue what Hezekiah 6.1 is. There isn't any Hezekiah 6.1 anyhow, you know. But at any rate, they quote these jolly things to me. <laughs> I don't know what they are. You don't know what they are. And these days, I don't pretend I know. I just say, well, tell me what it is, will you please? I, I'm no Bible scholar. That's what I tell them. Well, you don't know what Matthew 6.33 is unless you look it up, do you? Well, it says this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's your part. Do that. Just that. Don't worry about anything else. Seek first his kingdom. And God will do all the rest. Look, he'll pour things into your life. He literally will. And that's the promise of the rest of the verse. For Jesus said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. And he does just that. That's literally true. So, you keep living there full salvation I think there are one or two in the place tonight who are just young Christians I congratulate you oh you've got wonderful things ahead of you wonderful things and even at my age there are marvellous things ahead here and hereafter tremendous things that God has it's a tremendous thing apart from any other things attached. Nothing else attached. Just to know Jesus. I could go on for hours and hours, I won't. But you know, it is true that the Huntings have the loveliest little granddaughter in the whole of Adelaide. <coughs> Did you know that? Well, really, yesterday morning she howled because they were looking babysitting and she woke up and found herself in a, in a strange place and she cried, wailed. And we thought she was wonderful. She's never said a word to us. Never a word. But it's just sheer joy having that darling little baby granddaughter. She's just all joy. That's all. Just having her. And knowing him. Just knowing him. is all thrill and it's all joy and it's all wonderful. Without anything else. And I offer him to you tonight. Every one of you. You can open your heart and your life to him. If you want to come forward and receive him in this way, somebody wants to know, why do you have to come forward? Well, you don't. I'll tell you what's happened over and over. When folk haven't come forward and they've received Jesus into their lives, over and over again they've wanted to do it afterwards. I'll tell you why they've wanted to. Because, you know, when you receive him into your heart, somehow or other you want to declare it. It begins to be wonderful. Well, you were giving that opportunity if you want to take it. There was nothing magical about it. You're just affirming and confirming that you are receiving Jesus. You're saying yes to that. 